We have some new and exclusive information in this video, so stick around until the end for some fresh facts. Now, let's jump into a whole bunch of Nintendo game trivia. Pokemon Red and Blue need no introduction, having established what is now a mega multimedia franchise in the West. The earlier Japanese releases of the game, Red and Green, is where it all started, however. These earlier versions of the games have a variety of differences to the ones we got in the West, with a few references being lost in translation. The SS Anne had its name changed during its English localization, with the ship originally being called Saint Anne. This name may be similar, but the original Japanese name is actually a direct reference to one of Game Freak's earlier titles that predates the Pokemon franchise and their close relationship with Nintendo. St. Anne is a character featured in the Sega Genesis game Pulse Man, and is the computer that actually creates the titular Pulse Man. But more interestingly, and infamously, the Japanese versions include many bugs that are truly unbelievable and will have you wondering how the developers missed them. After setting off on their adventure, the player will eventually find themselves facing off against Sabrina, the gym leader in Saffron City. However, the player doesn't even need to defeat her in the Japanese games. Losing against Sabrina in these original versions still triggers the code showing that Sabrina has been defeated. When the player re-enters the gym, the text that is normally shown after the fight is displayed, and the player is rewarded with TM46, Psywave, as well as the Marsh Badge. This bug was acknowledged by the team and fixed for the international versions of the games, as well as the Japanese version of Blue. Another bug exists in these early versions and is still present in Pokemon Yellow, both in Japan and internationally. An important early event in these games has the player getting hold of a Pokedex, but obtaining this item is reliant on a specific detail to the player's data, the number of Pokemon they have or have had in their possession. If the player has two Pokemon species registered to their data prior to obtaining the Pokedex of Professor Oak, which is tricky to achieve considering the inability to obtain Pokeballs until after the Pokedex has been received, then Professor Oak will not take Oak's parcel off the player, and will not give them this vital item in return. This can be achieved rather simply by grinding their starter Pokemon against various low-level monsters on Route 1, until eventually it evolves. This evolution will count as a second Pokemon having been registered to the game. This unforeseen oversight had damning consequences for the player, as without obtaining the Pokedex, the old man located in Viridian City will also not move, as this only happens after the Dex has been obtained, essentially softlocking the game. Pokemon Yellow has another small detail that was easily missed by a number of players. It becomes evident at a certain point that the player needs some means of lighting their path forward after they encounter a cave. This can be done by obtaining HM05, which can be used to teach a Pokemon the move Flash, which is then used to light up the cave. However, there is another solution that relates to Pikachu. If Pikachu has learned either Thunderbolt or Thunder, Talking to the companion will cause it to spark, briefly lighting the cave as a result. This isn't as effective as Flash, however, as it's only a very temporary instance of illumination. That said, it can be repeated indefinitely, allowing the player to traverse the darkness, albeit in a slow, arduous manner. Let's move on to another heavy-hitting Nintendo series that got a lot of love on the Game Boy, The Legend of Zelda. During a 2013 Polygon interview with Shigeru Miyamoto, the legendary designer was asked his thoughts regarding how Telltale's Walking Dead series was delivering installments of the game to players episodically. His response was that Nintendo had already experimented with the concept of episodic gaming way back in 2001. He stated, When we first released The Legend of Zelda Oracle of the Ages and Oracle of Seasons on Game Boy Color many years ago, the original idea for those games was for them to be more episodic in content and the development actually started with the notion of potentially trying to sell dungeons individually. At the time that we were working on the Oracle games, we felt that it just wasn't right to deliver a game in that fashion. But when we look at what we've done with the eShop and the possibilities that lie there, and particularly with the fact that we're able to patch now existing games that have already been released, that then opens up the possibility for downloadable content or adding new levels to a game that has already been released. Early material for the Oracle games can be found within the final game itself, containing a selection of musical tracks that went unused. This includes the music you're hearing right now, a rather smooth, jazzy number. This piece is rather interesting in its own right, as it seems as though, while it may have been unused in this instance, it was later repurposed slightly and transformed into the theme for the Mogmas in the future Zelda title, Skyward Sword.
The Oracle games have quite a few regional differences too, and not just between Japan and the international releases, but even across different English releases. When Link makes his way to Holly's house through the chimney, naturally, she makes a reference to Santa Claus. It seems, at least in this instance, some of the team behind the game's European localization recognized that making this reference to Santa's existence in the Zelda universe would therefore mean that Christmas must also exist in some form within this world, and by extension, the Christian religion. As we've covered a multitude of times on this channel before, religious references in Nintendo games were also considered a major no-no for Nintendo, especially during this period. So this reference was altered to instead have Holly refer to Link as a chimney sweep. Another underrated Game Boy title is Donkey Kong Country, which had its own Game Boy Color release. This handheld game was published as Donkey Kong Country in the West, but its Super Famicom counterpart in Japan did not keep its original name when brought over to the Game Boy Color. On the Super Famicom, Donkey Kong Country was actually called Super Donkey Kong. And since this game was no longer a Super Famicom title, the Super in its name would have been an odd inclusion, as the prefix is used to denote the game present on the Super Famicom. Instead, this Game Boy Color game released under the name Donkey Kong 2001. A name change was probably justified anyway, as there are a fair few differences between the SNES and Game Boy versions of these games. One of which is an all new level in the handheld game called Necky Nutmare, found in Chimp Caverns. The English name for this level is some standard Donkey Kong Country style alliteration, but the Italians went in an ever so slightly different direction and gave us a solid chuckle too. The Italian name for this level is literally Necky's Nuts. Marvellous. Changes were made to another portable Donkey Kong game as well, Donkey Kong Land 2. The Japanese version features a number of design changes to its levels which ultimately make the game slightly easier. In Bramble Blast, a section just prior to the star barrel has two blast barrels pointing to the bottom right. Internationally, this part also features two zingers. The Japanese release only has one. In Parrot Shoot Panic, again, this is just before the star barrel, two zingers are entirely removed from the Japanese game. It's possible that the choice to remove these enemies was because of hardware limitation to prevent sprite overload from occurring, an issue that would come up in the international version if too many zingers were on screen during this section, which would have caused the DK barrel to not load in. Creepy Crow was also altered, where hitting the crow twice would make two hooks appear in Japan, the top hook is now higher up, as well as the platform above. The rope climbing portion of the stage was also shortened to accommodate this moved platform. Donkey Kong Land 3 has some Japanese exclusive content too, a complete re-release of the game which never saw release internationally. Roughly three years after the original game's release, an updated version was made for the Game Boy Color in the year 2000 called Donkey Kong GB, Dinky Kong and Dixie Kong. A variety of minor alterations were made across the board compared to the original Game Boy release, with this version ultimately being released on the Japanese 3DS Virtual Console in 2014. Next up we have a fact about Pokemon Puzzle Challenge, but before we get into that, a word from this episode's sponsor, Baiyi. If you've ever used American sites to buy things from Japan, you've probably noticed how much sellers jack up the price. It can be a lot. This is where Baiyi comes in. Baiyi is a service that places orders or bids on your behalf on Japanese shopping and auction sites, then ships the items straight to you without any absurd price hikes. This includes sites like Rakuten, Amazon Japan, and Yahoo Japan Auction. So, if you've been wanting to get hold of a Japanese game or piece of merch but don't want to pay insane rates, this service will let you get your hands on that stuff for a more affordable price. Baiyi is easy to use and offers support in several languages, which of course includes English. They also ship worldwide, including North America, Europe, and Oceania. Baiyi has over half a dozen international shipping methods, multiple payment methods, and four different insurance plans to match your needs. And if you're not aware, the value of the yen is very favorable to the US dollar right now, resulting in even greater savings. Baiyi is also giving Digino Gaming viewers a 2,000 yen first time purchase coupon for signing up through the link below. So if you want to try out this great service and get 2,000 yen off your first order, check out Baiyi by using the link below. And now, back to Pokemon. Pokemon Puzzle Challenge and Puzzle League are fairly run-of-the-mill games released on the Game Boy and Nintendo 64 respectively, with the Game Boy game even including an animation in reference to the N64 release of Pokemon Stadium. Jinx's losing animation depicts nothing but its hair waving a white flag in defeat, in a similar manner to when Jinx is defeated in Stadium. 
Now we've already brought up some unused data found in game code, but this one surely takes the prize as being one of the most unbelievable volumes of data that wound up being left unused. We say unused, but it can be accessed, but to say it's unlikely anybody did is perhaps an understatement. Within the game's data is nearly a fully fleshed out and finished game of Panel Dupont, the game that Pokemon Puzzle League is based on, with its SNES game having been localized in the West as Tetris Attack. We've mentioned in the past how the N64 game was based on Panel Dupont, and that there was an unreleased game that was reworked for the N64. But this is also true of the Game Boy game as well. To access the alternative game on the same cartridge, the player must attempt to boot the game on the original Game Boy or equivalent hardware. A warning screen stating that the game will only work with the Game Boy Color will appear, but by pressing A 24 times and then B 24 times, Panel Dupont will launch instead of Pokemon. It's also possible to do this with Game Boy Color hardware from the game's title screen. Get ready for this. The player must press up twice, right four times, down once, left ten times, then up four times, right once, down six times, and then press B. This will load up the warning screen again, where pressing both A and B 24 times will launch the unreleased Game Boy Panel Dupont. We have some exclusive Pokemon trivia coming up later, so stick around for that. But until then, how about some Kirby trivia? Have you ever noticed that the cartridges for an original Game Boy game and a Game Boy Color game have a physical difference? Games released for the original Game Boy feature a small notch in their top right corner, but this isn't the case for Game Boy Color games. Well, this is true most of the time, but Kirby Tilt and Tumble is a unique outlier to this fact. While this game was released for the Game Boy Color and only works on a color system, the cartridge does feature a notch. The notch lets this Game Boy Color exclusive game fit in an original grey Game Boy. Even if another Game Boy Color game is put in an original Game Boy, it simply wouldn't boot because the notch is needed so that the power button can be slid into the on position. If the player tries to play Tilt and Tumble however, a message will appear which reads, this game pack will only work with the Game Boy Color video game system. It could be that the cartridges used for Tilt and Tumble were simply repurposed from another non-color game, possibly to save on costs and reuse old excess stock. It's also worth noting that you may have seen one of these game pack will only work with the Game Boy Color messages elsewhere, as the GBC games can fit and boot up on the Game Boy Pocket as that system lacks the notch mechanism. But Tilt and Tumble is the only color title that can be booted on an OG Game Boy unmodified. Nintendo games are great and all, but let's look at an often overlooked gem on the Game Boy Color, Metal Gear Ghost Babble. Ghost Babble, or just Metal Gear Solid in Europe, appears to have a character actually based on a real person that has seemingly nothing to do with the Metal Gear franchise. In the game, the character Brian McBride was an agent of the CIA and director of operations of African Affairs. The real Brian McBride, on the other hand, was an American soccer player. Metal Gear's McBride is an American in his 30s, and the real McBride was in his 30s when the game was released. The real McBride was also featured in Konami's Pro Evolution Soccer series, with Konami having, of course, developed and published Ghost Babble. The two also have distinct visual similarities, such as a strong chin and jawline, and lines below their eyes. It's hard to say if this is just a big coincidence, or if someone at Konami liked the name and look of Brian McBride and wanted to use his likeness in-game. The Castlevania spin-off Kid Dracula had some changes made to its international release because of a symbol that could have been misconstrued. The game's first boss is depicted in the Japanese release, with what some have referred to as a swastika on his forehead. However, this is not a swastika, but a manji, a Buddhist symbol for balance which can represent love, mercy, strength, and intelligence. Because the symbol is often mistaken for its objectionable twin, the international version removes the symbol, and the boss's hood has been reworked to look, well, less clanny. The aforementioned religious connotations were also part of why the game was reworked for overseas audiences. The tower in the game's intro was changed to remove this cross, as well as the bell, to remove religious symbology. Despite this removal, the sound of the bell is still featured in its introduction. 
Bonk is probably one of the lesser known platformers that has been a staple to Japanese audiences since its early days on the PC engine. Bonk's Revenge on the Game Boy is a completely different game that shares a name with Bonk's Revenge on the TurboGrafx-16. The Game Boy title is yet another game that needed a few changes when it was brought to the West due to different cultural sensibilities. In the original version released in Japan, obtaining the Thief power-up would alter Bonk's appearance into something that could be deemed as eerily similar to typical blackface. Likely as a way to not cause offence, this was altered outside of Japan, with Bonk now looking like he's just broken out of prison instead. This next piece might be a bit odd, but it certainly gives us a glimpse into some very rare sprite work. Chris World was an in-flight entertainment system created by Singapore Airlines about a decade ago, with one of its major features being the inclusion of video games that were available to play through the Nintendo Gateway system, a service that put emulated games on flights and in hotels. In a commercial for this service, we can see a young child playing Super Mario Bros. Deluxe, the Game Boy Color port of the original Super Mario Bros. Mario pops out of the child's screen as a 3D model, but if we slow this footage down, we can actually see a single frame of a Mario Mario sprite never featured in the game at all, with Mario facing the screen. It's arguable that a more popular Mario handheld adventure came in the form of Super Mario Land, a launch title for the system that introduced a variety of bizarre new elements to Mario. But this title's strange new world only helped establish it within pop culture. There's a few officially licensed Super Mario Land songs featured on the Super Mario Compact Disco album, and how this whole album came to be is quite the story. It's easy to assume that the album was commissioned by Nintendo of America. However, this is not the case at all. All. Instead, the track was a result of UK musician Simon Harris taking matters into his own hands. He was unable to get permission from Nintendo in the West, so he instead had to make his way to the boss on his own, going straight to Shigeru Miyamoto for approval and directly playing him a Super Mario Land rap song. He stated, Nintendo UK didn't really exist at the time, and we couldn't get a whole lot of sense out of Nintendo of America. So, naively, we just hopped on a plane, flew to Japan, and made an appointment to see Shigeru Miyamoto. Luckily, he loved it. Harris would elaborate on this story further in a 2017 interview, stating that he first got approval from Nintendo UK for the Super Mario Land single before he wound up going over to Japan to get approval from Miyamoto for the album. While Super Mario Land had a number of oddities within the Mario series, it isn't alone. Bizarre things can be spotted through Mario's adventure in the game's sequel, Super Mario Land 2 Six Golden Coins. In the game's ending, Wario loses his hat and is depicted as being bald, despite the fact he clearly has hair while he's wearing his hat. A Super Mario Land 2 manga explains away this oddity by revealing that Wario is indeed bald, but he has a wig attached to the inside of his hat. The manga also goes on to explain a pretty strange aspect of Mario Land 2, giving some context to the hippo statue found on the game's overworld that acts as an access point for the space zone, an area that has seemingly no relation to a hippo. The logic to this is that, of course, the statue was created to honor a hippo astronaut that was never mentioned anywhere in the game itself. Nothing screams 90s America quite like Wayne's World, and nothing screams 90s video game easter eggs like hidden images in a game's code, especially when they can only be seen via convoluted and obscure passwords. While playing the game, holding start and pressing A, B, A, down, left, A, and then down, which spells out a bad lad, will cause an image of the game's programmer to appear on screen. This devilishly handsome man clearly didn't want to take all the glory, as he also included a friend of his, visible by holding start and then pressing right A down, right B, right A, showing what it claims is an engineer at Radical Entertainment stuck inside a Game Boy. One final image can be seen in this same way, holding down start and pressing select A, left A, down, left A, select, select. Spelling out salad lass. This will show a picture of Evie, likely the programmer's girlfriend. Scooby-Doo classic creep capers did something similar to this, but perhaps with a slight bit of extra effort on the implementation part. Typically, the game's final cinematic will reveal the face of the game's main villain behind a spooky mask, as with any good Scooby-Doo ending. However, within the game's data is an unused script that alters this cutscene, revealing the true bad guys of this story to be the game's developers themselves. This unused cutscene cannot be accessed in-game without the use of hacking tools to modify the game's code, making it a pretty deeply hidden secret. 
Star Ocean Blue Sphere is another rather interesting game for the Game Boy. Earlier entries in the series were released on home console, and the Sony PlayStation at that. This was brought up during an interview with the game's designer, Tetsu Takayoshiki, who explained why the game ended up on a Nintendo handheld. After Star Ocean and Star Ocean Second Story, it was decided that we would make Star Ocean 3 for the PS2. The question then became how to fill the gap while we waited for that project to begin. From the beginning, our plans were to make a compact game, but there is another interesting facet to this portable game. While in some cases there was additional content in cross-generational games, which would work with an original Game Boy and Game Boy Color, this additional content was usually locked to those playing on the more powerful Color hardware. In Star Ocean Blue Sphere, a cracked statue can be found in Gravis Desert. If the game is played on the Game Boy Color, there is no means of entering through this crack, but on the OG Game Boy, there is actually an accessible opening. Inside is a room with a character who gives the player the choice of opening up one of two chests, both containing rare power-ups, an unusual benefit for those using older hardware. Sticking with RPGs, one of the biggest third-party developers out there is arguably Square Enix, or Squaresoft during the era of the Game Boy. But having created some of the most popular JRPGs of all time, their other franchises weren't quite as well known in Western markets. The company released Seekin Densetsu for the Game Boy, renaming the title to Final Fantasy Adventure for North America in 1991. But the project wasn't always set for the Game Boy and was originally far more ambitious, starting life in 1987 for the Famicom Disk System. The Famicom Disk System enabled users to play games on rewritable and more economical diskettes, while still utilizing the power of the NES or Famicom. During this period of Seekin Densetsu's life, Advertisements for the game were suggesting that the title would span an unprecedented five discs and would be a role-playing epic. Had this project continued, of course, it would have inevitably been one of the largest games ever made for Nintendo's 8-bit home console. Rumors have often floated around that there were former Squaresoft employees who have some form of prototype of this project in their possession, as well as early versions of Final Fantasy IV but Moriyama has stated that there was never really any real progress made on this project at the time, and that these rumors were nothing more than hearsay. As LostLevels.org points out, the name was trademarked at an early stage, but the game never actually entered development. A five-disc game was simply too ambitious, and the title was cancelled early on. From one mega JRPG series to another, Dragon Quest 1 and 2, as well as Dragon Quest 3 on the Game Boy Color, were localized into English by Nob Ogasawara, a name you might recognize as the man who also localized most of the early Pokemon games into English. Nob recently spoke about his experience working with Enix USA, which sounded amazing for all the wrong reasons. According to Nob, Enix USA were extremely cheap. Before their merger with Square, they operated out of a two-story, four-suite, cheaply constructed building which also had a nail salon within it. The place had plywood doors and no reception space or counter, and was in a bit of a grungy area in North Seattle. Nob even described it as having all the charm of a hastily constructed war room in a former lumber warehouse. The company's deadlines were harsh and their pay was awful, but it seemed the staff had a decent amount of freedom as long as deadlines were met. However, it appears that Nob had to fight for basic changes to these games that were necessary to fit English text onto the tiny Game Boy screen. For example, Nob was told he needed to localize every item name into English only using seven characters, which is somewhat understandable. But for items such as the Falcon Sword, this was obviously not doable. He was simply told to crunch the names down so it would be something like Falcon Sword, which frankly would have been a bit shit. Instead of making every dyslexic gamer cry, Nob came up with the solution of adding basic icons to the item names, so the Falcon Sword would be called Falcon with a sword icon next to it. Another ingenious space-saving method proposed by Nob was to add letters to the game's font table that had the apostrophes built in. Nob met resistance to both of these requests, but told Enix USA to just do it. Both changes made their way into the final games. And now for that exclusive Pokemon trivia we talked about earlier, last year we translated an interview from the Japanese Nintendo Online magazine into English. The interview is from July 2000, and the interviewee is Takashi Kawaguchi, who was the producer on the original Pokemon games, and worked on a bunch of other noteworthy titles such as Mother and Earthbound. Based on what Kawaguchi says in the interview, a huge part of Pokemon's identity comes from someone you might not expect. 
Despite usually being viewed as an empty suit, the Pokemon Company CEO, Tsunakazu Ishihara, actually changed the course of Pokemon's development early on. Back when Pokemon was just a bunch of designs and prototypes, Game Freak founder, Satoshi Tajiri, had other work he needed to take care of, and asked to pause production on Pokemon, which lasted about three years. It wasn't until development resumed that Ishihara would give the team some direction. Kawaguchi said in the interview, Ishihara was really into all kinds of card games, and I think he said something along the lines of, if we incorporate elements from card games into Pokemon, we can make something interesting. So it was those ideas added late in development by Ishihara that turned Pokemon into what it is today. These comments were echoed in another interview that we had translated, this time from the May 23rd, 2019 issue of Famitsu Weekly. In this interview, Pokemon's Junichi Masuda stated, Yes, we received a lot of help as a company from Tsunakatsu Ishihara, now CEO of the Pokemon Company, and Shigeru Miyamoto, now Nintendo Managing Director, who were both at Nintendo. Ishihara in particular was fond of card games and used that insight to advise on how to add more depth to the battle system. To be honest, things like the Pokemon types, the Link Cable battles, and the Pokedex were all added later in development based on his suggestions. It may come as no surprise then that Tsunakatsu Ishihara actually initiated the development of the Pokemon trading card game. This is likely why he got a cameo in the Pokemon trading card games on the Game Boy, appearing as the experienced collector, Mr. Ishihara. Did you know that Super Mario 64 DS might have been planned to be even more different from the original on the N64? Or that Heart Gold and Soul Silver got their names because Game Freak wanted them to represent meaningful moments with Pokemon? For more facts on Nintendo DS games, check out the video on screen. Don't forget to subscribe and thanks to everyone for watching. Special thanks to Jacob Newcomb for the Japanese translations. See you next time.